The following is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. I'm actually really looking forward to this topic, which I know a little, not little of anything about, but I want to say a little bit about this topic and then I'll introduce him. Uh, so uh, Mr. Jones uh, said that he grew up not knowing anything about the USCTs, but he has researched and discovered almost 100 USCTs from the Witten Triangle, which he'll be talking about in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, he will discuss how they contributed to the war and how they were interconnected by family and community, despite serving in different regiments in several fields of battle. He will discuss uh, how the USCTs made uh, significant post-war contributions as well, and we'll see some media apparently also. Now, having said that, uh, Marvin Jones is the owner of Marvin T. Jones and Associates, which is a photography uh, uh, company in Washington, D.C. here uh, that serves businesses, institutions, and governments. He's worked in South America, the Caribbean, and Africa, and Mr. Jones' documentary uh, photography of Haiti and the East African nation of African nation of Somaliland was exhibited at the OA Organization of American States, Howard University, California African American Museum, and the Roanoke Chowan Community College. Uh, Mr. Jones's long career as a photographer has expanded to other forms of documentary media through his funding of the 2008 the Chowan Discovery Group. The mission is to research, document, and preserve and present the 400 plus year old history of land owning tri-racial people of color of the Winton uh, Triangle, this area in, in North, Eastern uh, North Carolina, which he will be discussing. Uh, in 2009, he produced his first major presentation, a stage production scripted by Jones called the Winton Tri Triangle. He's successfully nominated eight uh, North Carolina uh, historical markers, including three involving the Civil War, and he's also succeeded in placing the Pleasant Plains School, the Winton Triangles, first on the National Register of uh, Historic Places. And he's got quite a bio. Uh, he's also produced five video documentaries and writings and many articles. Uh, his work for the uh, CDG uh, has yielded awards of excellence from the North Carolina Society of Historians and the African American Historical and Genealogical Society. So our speaker tonight has quite a background and we we'll look forward to his presentation, which I hope I'm gonna turn over to him to start now. Thank Take you, away, Mr. Jones. <laughs> uh, thank you much, John. And, and, and thank you, Kurt. For I really would like to, th I very much want to thank Susan Claffey who brought me to your attention uh, in the beginning and Susan's here this evening. Also like to, acknowledge the presence of members of the Rock Creek Civil War Roundtable and the Alliance to Preserve the Civil War Defenses of Washington, of which I'm a, of whom I'm a board member, um, among whom are uh, Patricia Tyson, who is, who is the coordinator of the DC, of the Rock Creek Civil War Roundtable, and Marty Jewett, who's uh, all three of us on the board of the Alliance, and others has probably joined in as well. Um, and I will, again, my community is unusual. It's mostly made up of mixed race land owning and business owning people of color in, in Northeast and North Carolina. And as I began researching the Winton Triangle's past, I wondered what was its role in the Civil War. I only, at first, I only knew that the Union military burned Winton, which is our county seat, which is only five miles from my farm. Um, and I'm talking to you from our family farm right now. It's a it's an indirect result of my great grandfather's bonus paid when he enlisted. It's, it's been in the family since 1886. 
and my wife and I, are, Carol and I, are spending most of our pandemic time, or at least half of our pandemic time, in North Carolina and and, and in D.C. Um, I later learned that two of my relatives, including my great grandfather, um, served. Well, actually, three of my relatives, including my great grandfather, served in the Union Army. And it went on to where I have 21 members who were in USCTs and in the Union Navy. And then I began finding more Union service in the Winston Triangle. First, I want to tell you what Chawan Discovery is, and it's pronounced Chawan. It's named after our river. It was launched in 2009, and we began with a stage production in our local community theater to tell the community what the Winston Triangle story was about. It included 39 people on stage, made up of two choirs, the uh, Meharin Chwano Indian dancers and drummers, and students acting out on, acting out on skits. And it ran for two nights. We had about 400 people to attend, and that was how we announced, announced what we were doing. Um, our research comes from archives, family collections, books, internet, internet sources, cemeteries, farms, and fee-based sources like Ancestry.com. From this research, we have been successful in successfully nominating eight North Carolina highway markers uh, for Indian villages and events involving people of color. Uh, our, eighth mar our first marker was for the Choanoak people, the original people, and I'm a, I'm a Choanoak descendant. This is me with my family. And these are some of the other markers, the town of Desimunky, uh, Puck, like that's a monkey puck. Uh, don't step in it. Uh, a, a village that was destroyed uh, a year before the Lost Colony, and the Lost Colony itself attacked the village as well. Um, the North Carolina State College Fair, Parker Robbins, who I'll talk about later, the town of Cuscagoc, which um, the early North Carolina English colonists destroyed also and the Freedmen's Colony, which were developed during the Civil War out of refugees from the Confederacy on Roanoke Island. Our newest marker, our newest marker before I talk about the one you see here, the burning of Winton's, is to be, will be erected next year. And it is for General Edward Wiles' raid that ran between Hampton Roads and Elizabeth City. It was in December of 1863. The raid was made up of about 2,000 USCTs, and North Carolina was in quite, the white North Carolinian leadership was in quite a stir because many of these men had been enslaved only six, eight months earlier, and now they're returning as as uniformed soldiers with guns, and they're destroying Confederate uh, guerrilla camps and store and store areas and defenses. Uh, only a few weeks ago a Civil War Trails marker was replaced. Uh, the old one had, had deteriorated. And, and this new panel included Chawan Discovery's information about one of our soldiers, Martin Van Buren Reynolds, and I'll talk a little bit about him later. I write articles, and some of these articles are used for some of these nominations as well. This is where uh, I, I wrote an article for a local paper about Robert Lee Van, one of our natives. You see him on the right holding Shirley Temple. On the left is Bill Dangles Robinson in Hollywood. Next slide is the marker of Robert Lee Van and his profile. We've also placed one of our oldest schools, our oldest, uh, our oldest schools, the Pleasant Plains School on the National Register of Historic Places. The school was founded in 1866, where well, the first schoolhouse was founded in 1866, but I found evidence that it existed before the Civil War. And this is a school for people of color in a rural area. Uh, the current schoolhouse that you see here is a Roosevelt schoolhouse built in 1920. Uh, we support a lot of researchers, authors. They have, they have used our work in, in many books and discussions. We've given uh, history tours to professionals from Duke University, North Carolina a and University. No, in fact, we recently gave uh, North Carolina a and a collection of farm equipment uh, for the Black Farmers Collection. 
North Carolina Central University. Uh, we've supported graduate students. We've um, Fayetteville State University, Brevard College, the North Carolina Office of State Preservation, East Carolina University, and North Carolina and the Roanoke Chuan Heritage Center. We won awards from the North Carolina Society of Historians and the Afro-American Genealogical and Historical Society as well. And that's, that's our short blurb on Chihuahua Discovery's work. And now I'll talk about Winton Triangle's men of color in the Civil War and their families of USCTs. Our community was first, came, was first written about in 1854 when the English came to, North, to Outer Banks in North Carolina. They first heard about the Chihuahua people in the few weeks that that first English expedition stayed offshore and met with the, met with the Roanoke people at Roanoke Island. And John White, one of the explorers who was an artist, drew, drew this very famous map, the Virginia Powers map. And you can see in the inset, in the inset a close-up of a ship. And the ship is at the confluence of two rivers. The lower river is the Roanoke River. The ship is in the Albemarle Sound. It's the Chihuahua River, and you see uh, where Chihuahua, the capital of the Chihuahua people, are located. The next slide is of two of North Carolina and Hertford County. North Carolina is seen in red, and then you have a larger, a larger map of Hert of um, Hertford County, and you can see where in the brown shaded area. My estimation of the Winston Triangle's land ownership in the 1960s when I was a teenager, when I was growing up. Um, the, the Roanoke River, I mean the Chihuahua River is shown in blue. And I call it the Winston Triangle because the land ownership traverses the triangle made by the three towns of Winton, Coalfield, and Ahaska. And historically, the Winton Triangle was made up of mixed race land owning people. In this photograph, I'm related to so many of these people, um, going back into the even even to the uh, 17th century. The first landowner in the Winton Triangle of color were recorded as William Weaver, whose grandfather came from India um, in six, around 1690, and Thomas Archer, and they both bought land on the Potocasi Creek and the Chickaman Creek. And this was when, when um, they may have had white wives. A lot of, a lot of uh, indentured women had, ma had mated and married men of color. And they could have been from India, Africa. They could have been Native American. Uh, that we don't know. But we do know a lot of these people, uh, mixed race children during that time in the scene in 1700s, uh, many of them had, had white mothers. And so their children moved to the Winston Triangle to be landowners where it was easy to do so that, rather than in Virginia. And you had other families like the Manley Halls and the Nixes who followed, and many of their sons served in the American Revolution. And this community continued to grow, and they wanted a church around 1830. They were pressing for a church. The community was forming a center of gravity. Uh, but then the Nat Turner Rebellion came along, and it was a tremendous backlash. Uh, Southampton County, where the rebellion took place, is next door to Northampton to Hertford County. And whenever I'm driving between the Winton Triangle and D.C., I pass this highway marker for the Nat Turner Rebellion. This is the oldest document in my family, and it's dated August 21st, 1831. When I first saw it, I said, well, Noah Robbins is a Choanoke. He was a free man. Why did he need a document certifying that he's a free man? And then by that time, I was quite aware that the Nat Turner Rebellion had taken place next to my county, although that was never discussed growing up. I didn't know about the Nat Turner Rebellion until William Styron produced his novel, and it was on the bestseller list in the Time magazine that we received week after week after week when I was in high school. That's how I learned about Nat Turner, although it was next door and although it affected my family and community. This document states 
nor Robbins, a man of color, have made an application to this court to grant him a certificate certifying that he is a free man and a native of this county, and in proofs being read to that effect, is then and there ordered that the clerk of said court should give to said Noah Robbins a certificate certifying that he is a free man of color and a native of said county and entitled to all rights and privileges of free persons of color. We move from 1831 to 1850. Uh, the tensions generated by the backlash to Nat Turner subsided somewhat and police church was pressing the white powers that be to form, to form a church again. And among pre-war leaders pushing for a church in the Pleasant Plains community, which is the heart of the Winston Triangle, were um, Sally Jones Weaver, who's an ancestral aunt, and she's married to an ancestral uncle, Willis Weaver. I'm, just, um, I'm descended from both their parents. And Sally Jones Weaver's brother, Wiley Jones, and I'm also related to Wiley's wife, Mary Wyatt. Hey, it's a small community. Um, so in 1850, a contract was drawn up between Willis Weaver's brother and the future congregation to build a church. And the church was finished in 1851 and founded in 1851, and that's Pleasant Plains Baptist Church. I am probably, I'm definitely fifth generation member of Pleasant Plains and probably sixth generation. And the church and the chapel you see here is the 1875 chapel. From 1851 to 1861, you have the time that builds up to the Civil War. And the Civil War really hit home in the Winter Triangle in February 19th, 1862, when the Union gunboats having an well, an amphibious assault on Roanoke Island. Uh, was quickly successful. The, the amphibious force moved up the Albemarle Sound. They took, they took um, Elizabeth City, uh, Edenton, which is a pretty waterside town, capitulated without any shots being fired. And then, they, then the gunboats proceeded up the Chihuahuan River. Um, they proceeded past the town of Corain, where the wharf, where the Confederates had burned the wharf. But when they got to Winton, they already had the information that there were sympathizers in Winton, and they were expected some sort of welcome. Well, that was the case. The sympathizers had been run out by Confederates, and the Confederates forced a Pleasant Plains woman, um, uh, Mark Keen, onto the wharf and used her as a lure to ambush a gunboat. Now, history talks about this ambush. Uh, but they don't talk much about Martha Keene. Martha Keene was a 35-year-old married woman with three children. Her father-in-law was a founder of Pleasant Plains. And this happened on February 19th. Fortunately, the commander of the USS Delaware, of the USS Delaware saw the uh, guns above on the Palisades in Winton, turned the boat around, it was fired upon, and Martha Keene was not caught between two sets of gunfire and cannon fire. Uh, she, she was not injured. Um, the Delaware went down river, brought back some more gunboats, and when was burned the next day. I've had the fortune of holding the cannonball that you see here, one cannonball that the Union fired. It was lodged in a, in a chimney that I knew about when I was in high school. Also, my uncle Wiley Jones is said, was said to, be, to have been in the trees uh, celebrating the flames uh, from Winton. We were taught that the burning of Winton was a bad thing, but actually the burning of Winton was the beginning of change, uh, the destruction of slavery, and new freedoms for people who were already considered free but had, all, had, a, had a tremendous load of restrictions against them. Including, for example, it was against the law to have more than two dogs. I mean, so so many things. So you see a list of Winton Triangle men. Um, this is a short list, not a complete list, of Winton Triangle men who are in one regiment, the 14th Heavy Artillery. And many of them are from the same families. 
Uh, there are two Collins brothers, two, two Manlins. There are quite a few Reynoldses. There are Searses. There are two Scots. There are a pile of weavers. And Martha King's brother-in-law was a weaver cousin, and he was in this regiment as well. Nick, and looking close at the weaver family of soldiers in the 14th Heavy uh, Artillery, I include Samuel Walden. And this, uh, this regiment was used mainly as garrison soldiers and laborers in uniform in New Bern and in Beaufort, North Carolina. Samuel Walden married into the Weaver family. And the Union Army, the Union, or nor, nor the Union Army or Confederate Army notified soldiers that their men had been wounded or died in war. They had to find out by other means or not at all. The Winton Triangle had a lot of men and women who were literate, even though that was against the law in North Carolina. It was obvious from their writings immediately after the war and some writings before. And one Winton Triangle sergeant who was in the 14th Heavy Artillery, Enoch Luton, wrote a letter to Nancy Weaver Walden. And the letter states, Dear Madam, I now seat myself as to let you know that I'm in common health and that all the boys are living. All right, here comes the contrary part. Richard R. Weaver, who's Nancy's cousin, are dead and your, and your husband, Samuel Walden, also. He lived about a month after he got to the regiment. He died with the typhoid dysentery. He requested I should write to you. You see, not long after I found this letter in the archives, I was contacted by Enoch Luton IV, who sent me Enoch Luton's photograph and I sent him a, a, cop, a copy of Enoch Luton's letter. How, how fortunate was that? Here is Nancy Weaver Walden. She is the daughter of Sally Jones Weaver and Willis Weaver. She's my first cousin, uh, three times removed. She's, not, she's buried not far from where I'm sitting on the farm in the Winton Triangle. It took her 57 years to get a pension. Many times it was because um, Couples of color did, couldn't produce proof that they were married, but it took her 57 years. When she finally did get all her back pay, she was shocked at the amount, had a heart attack, and died in 1922. We also move on to the Reynolds family soldiers in the 14th, uh, 14th Regiment. Again, these soldiers are, are related. They are neighbors. They all know each other. Um, they served, again, as garrison soldiers and laborers in New Bern and in Beaufort. One of them, Thomas Reynolds, um, in his pension record, there's, there's a testimony of him escaping from the Confederacy. His Conrad, Matthew Walden, who's probably the cousin of Sam and uh, 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 Samuel Walden and his brother James, wrote, I was with him when 29 of us ran a, run away from her County NC to get to the Union lines. It was in February 1864, and we were about three weeks getting to Plymouth, North Carolina, about 60 miles from Hertford County. I remember we came on a boat called a bombshell from Catherine Creek on the Roanoke River. Uh, the bombshell was actually destroyed the following month in a battle just off the, off the Chihuahua uh, just off the Chihuahua River. Uh, the next family is the Bazell Collins family of soldiers. John Bazell, who was a founder of Pleasant Plains Church and the uncle of, of, of the three Collins brothers, was in 14th Heavy. And he was with his brothers, his nephews, John and Simon. This is his mark from the contract he signed the, when the church was being built. The oldest brother, Thomas Collins, served in the otherwise all-white Pennsylvania uh, Infantry, 188 Pennsylvania Infantry. These were men of there were men of color who were assigned to white regiments, and John Collins was one of them. He was wounded at Coal Harbor in June of 1864. He was a brick mason, he was a teacher, and he was the first pastor of color at Pleasant Plains Church. I mention that because Pleasant Plains was founded one of the conditions was white had to oversee the church. The pastor had to be white. And that lasted until after the war. Uh, we couldn't have our own pastor. Again, it's the second slide of Brazil Collins' family of soldiers. John Collins was again in the 14th, 14th 
Um, he and his brother Simon helped the veterans who applied for pensions. You see Simon at the bottom. He was also head of the local Grand Army of the Confederacy of the Republic. In Winton, he was a teacher, a brick mason. He testified for veterans who applied for pensions, just like his brother uh, John did. Uh, here we have a picture that a, le a letter that Simon Collins wrote to one of our leader, educational leaders, W. D. Newsom. Newsom was overseeing several uh, Freedmen's Bureau schools after the war, and Simon was teaching at one of them. And you see Simon's signature under his photograph that I placed. This is another spreadsheet. Went and triangle soldiers in the 2nd Cavalry, USC. I recently came up with more soldiers than this, probably four times as many from our area, not necessarily from the Winton Triangle, but in, in other parts, but in our county. Um, and the 2nd Cavalry was formed around December, January, 1863, 1864. By April, they were fighting in Suffolk. They made their way to Petersburg and Richmond until the war's end. They were in Texas around the time of June 10th. They were poised on the Mexican border to thwart the French invasion of Mexico. They never did enter Mexico, however. And we talk about the Robbins family. Now my, my family, I'm a Robbins descendant. Um, my mother was a Robbins and I'm on, I'm on the Robbins farm right now, or one of the Robbins farms. Uh, the first Robbins we'll talk about, and you, you see them spell with one B or two Bs. There's John Robbins and this is in January of 1864. And he was wounded in his first battle, hand-to-hand -hand fighting when he fell off his horse and he was struck by a sable. It took several months before it was several months before he received medical treatment. He fought along with his cousins Park and Augustus. He was sent to Brazil, Santiago, Texas, at the time of June T, uh, to support the anti-monarchist forts forces in Mexico. And John eventually lost sight in that eye. The next slide you see a letter from John Robbins to the pension commissioner in August of. Uh, 1889. Quote, I will mention the date of skirmish, the day of April of 1864. It was a total loss of my right eye through a saber wound inflicted by, inflicted by the enemy in this skirmish in Suffolk, Virginia. No army surgeon or assistant was present for three months after the fight. I healed the wounded flesh myself in three or four weeks. The broken bone was very painful and not healed for a great length of time. My right eye has almost failed. It has been over 10 years since I failed to hold, hold office on account of my failure of eyesight. In addition to that letter to the commissioner, one of his officers who at that time by 1890 had become South Dakota's first attorney general, Robert Dollard. And Robert Dollard wrote a, an autobiography, and he mentioned this incident. He didn't mention Robbins by name, but he mentioned this incident. But he adds to John Robbins' pension application this letter, quote, John H. Robbins was wounded. He remembers distinctly the remarkable escape from death of said Robbins and the struggle where he was wounded. That he was struck on the head by his assailant in a hand-to-hand -hand conflict in which we were all engaged with a saber. And it was at that time regarded as miraculous that he was not instantly killed thereby. Robert Dollar continues, I am glad to support your claim for a pension with my affidavit of the facts connected with the remarkable struggle of your personal encounter at Suffolk. It is proper that I should be able on this day to pay some slight tribute to a member of a company that 26 years ago today at Jones Bridge on the Chickahominy River did itself in the race to which its rank and file belonged, a credit ought to be imperishable in history. Although injustice had denied such a place. Again, signed by Robert Dollard. I show this picture of Richmond because that's what it took to defeat slavery, to defeat the tyranny that the South and other forces beyond the South supported. The next Robbins we'll talk about is 
Parker Robbins. My grandfather uh, was named after Parker David Robbins. My grandfather has the same name. His father named him after his first cousin, his illustrious first cousin. He lived from 1834 to 1917. He was a sergeant major of the Second Cavalry. He was a Chilwanoke descendant, and he was from Gates County, which is north of Hereford County. Um, Robbins' regiment, regiment fought from Suffolk to Richmond to the end of the war. You also know that that regiment was in Texas at the town of Juneteenth. After the war, he was a state legislator, a postmaster, a holder of two U.S. patents, a sawmill owner, a house builder, steamship builder, and owner. And Chihuahua Discovery has, put, has uh, got the state to put up a highway historical marker dedicated to him. He married Elizabeth Collins, and he and Elizabeth Collins married in 1858, and her brothers were John Collins, Simon Collins, and Thomas Collins that I talked about. You see um, a letter he wrote Elizabeth when he was in the North Carolina General Assembly. He states in the letter that the next time he leaves home, he'll take her with, with uh, he'll take her with him, and he'll never leave her again because she has to run the farm, pre oversee the farm, pretty much on her own. Uh, they had no children, so she had a lot of responsibilities. You also see one of his patents on the right for a saw sharpening machine. You see North Carolina Civil War trails on the Albemarle front. Whenever historians talk about USCTs in North, in North Carolina, or when they talk about the Civil War trails and they want to include people of color, which is more and more likely to happen these days, Parker Robbins is always the poster child for that. His portrait is is in the, uh, the North Carolina History Museum, has his portrait, got it from his daughter-in-law. Um, the museum opened up an exhibit called The Black Presence of North Carolina in, 18, in 1979, and they had the portrait, his uniform, and other items belonging to Parker Robbins. The curator wrote this article, The Indomitable Parker D. Robbins, in the Iowa State Magazine. Um, it was the first time he had been discussed in length in 18, and this is in 1979. I was lucky to meet with the curator at the time. A year earlier, I did not know about this relative. And uh, this exhibit brought out the discussion about him and my family. Again, this is the day you see dedication of, of Parker Robbins Highway Historical Marker. In January of 2012, on the, the annual Martin Luther King Day celebration in Duplin County, uh, this marker was unveiled. We had reenactors from the Second Light Artillery based in Wilmington to come, and a lot of people attended. Uh, when I asked the, the reenactors to come, they said they would. They called me the next day and said, well, we have some Confederate women in mourning who also tend to come to our events and they like to come along. Can they come along? And I said, oh, this is strange. Uh, these black men in uniform and these white women in mourning for the Confederacy. I said, go ahead. This is the 21st century. Then the day after that, Sergeant Fred uh, uh, of the Light Artillery calls me again and says, one of the women says she's a Robbins descendant. And sure enough, the second, if you look at the picture at the right, on the second, the, the lady, uh, second from the left, her great-grandmother is a Robin. She showed me her picture. She clearly looks Native American. And I later, a researcher later told me that members of the Robbins family had moved to the Wilmington area during the 1800s. Isn't the 20th century an incredible time? Mm. This was held about half a mile from where he's buried and even closer to his now, Parker Robinson's now collapsed house. I am with, with three of my cousins, and I'm the mayor of Magnolia and a professor from Fayetteville State University. Also, um, the school system had 92 of its students to do drawings about Parker Robinson's house. I mean, life as a steamship, as a steamboat builder, a soldier, uh, a, a, tem a temple man, um, a, a constructor, and so on.
and I was allowed to photograph all of these. And a Robin's cousin even coughed up money for prizes to the students. Parker's brother, Augustus, 1842-1928, was a quartermaster sergeant in the same regiment. Uh, this slide is about Andrew Jackson Robbins. Uh, Andrew Jackson Robbins, 1848-1903, was a corporal in the 34th Regiment. And he was from the Children Oak community in Gates County. Uh, in April 64, he was on Morris Island at the mouth of Charleston's Harbor, and he and his brother labored on forts at Sir Charleston. Both fought the Battle of Honey Hill in South Carolina. After the war, he was a prosperous farmer with many children. One was a physician. His first son was named after Parker David Robbins. So this is my great-grandfather. Our farm really came from him, and it's been passed down to his son, to, to his granddaughter, my mother, and then to siblings and me. And I have, Park, I have Jack Robbins' original grave marker in the garage here on display. Jack Robbins, a promotion paper to corporal towards the end of the war. He was 18 years old. The next slide is a flyer I usually send out when I talk about uh, the Winton Triangle soldiers uh, in pre-pandemic time. And I want to show you this flyer because I show in it his relationship to other soldiers. You know, I mentioned he's a father of 15. He's a husband of three wives. He married two. My great-grandmother was the first wife that that uh that passed um he was a farmer he was a deacon he was son-in-law of a sailor he was brother-in-law of soldiers he was a cousin of soldiers and he was a brother of a soldier i mean think about all the relationships in the civil war that jack robbins had just in his family and then you'll see other relations uh, A.J. Reynolds, who was his brother-in-law and also was president of the local Grand Army of, of the Republic. James Walden was another neighbor of his. Um, Wal Wal in fact, Walden's farm is next to our farm. Um, he was a neighbor. He was also a Grand Army of, of the Republic, the president. And then you have Jack Robbins um, from his pension folder. Uh, you have t soldiers testifying for each, each other. In this case, in this case, you have um, John Collins and Sam Collins, who are testifying for for Jack's widow, uh, Susan Collins, Susan Victoria Collins. And so they were all working together to help each other with pensions and everything you could think of. Jack had an older brother. Uh, Noah Robbins was born in 1828. I've yet to find out when he died. Uh, li like, like his younger brother, he worked on forts in, in Charleston and, and, and fought at Honey Hill. Um, and he was also born in the Chowanoke mixed race community in Gates County, just across from the Chowan River. Again, in the family collection, Noah Robbins had a pass from the Provost Marshal in Suffolk in 1863, prior to his enlistment. Harry Jones, who, the late Harry Jones, who was curator of the Afro African American Civil War Museum, told me that to possess a pass for a man, a man of color, uh, to possess a pass from the Provost Marshal meant that Noah probably and other family members will stand for the union to, re to receive a pass directly from the provost marshal. And you hear, you see here, Nora Robbins, which means Nora Robbins, and two children to pass, pass to Norfolk. And they are on their way because they enlisted at Fort Monroe in Hampton. And Jack could have been one of the two children. Nora Robbins' pension application, quote, he contracted measles, resulting from disease in the lungs and consequent exposure to hardships there and then. Uh, continue. Work on fortifications then in the following manner. The troops had built a battery. His injury came from overtraining himself while at work on fortification. And you see the words Morris Island on this document. But the result was, again, the destruction of Charleston. You see this photograph of Charleston. 
uh, the ch this circular church was actually burned during the war. It was not destroyed by the troops. And you can see scaffolding that was used to try to reconstruct it or save it. But all around it was destroyed by the shelling. The next slide says three U.S. cities, three adjacent farms. Well, this is on our farm at the very end. Uh, Martin Van Buren Reynolds was in the same cavalry as, as a Park and Augustus and John. And after the war, he bought a farm outside of Coalfield, North Carolina, where I am. And on one side of his farm was Jack Robinson's farm. And on the other side was James Walton, who served in the same regiment as the Robbins brothers and cousins and Martin Van Buren Reynolds. My father bought this farm from Martin Van Buren Reynolds' son around 1950. And, uh, I have passed this grave thousands of times and it's always been well kept. And so one of the things, surprising things to learn is there's a USCT buried on our farm. Uh, James Walden is the last soldier I'll speak of. He married into the Weaver family, but he's also a neighbor of Martin Van Buren and Jack uh, Reynolds and, and, and Jack Robbins. Uh, he served with Park and Augustus John Robbins. His brother Samuel also married to the Weaver family, and his brother Samuel was in the 14th Heavy. James Walden went on to found two schools and was a Grand Army of the Republic chapter president in Winton. Um, for seven years, one of his daughters was really educated by John T. Reynolds, a not a USCT, but related to the Reynolds family of soldiers, and his wife Lydia Warwick Reynolds, and both of them were from in Freeman's Bureau teachers. Family photograph, James Walden married Millie Weaver, the daughter of Willis and Sally Jones Weaver. Most of the seven Walden daughters attended Shaw University, and Shaw University was founded by a chaplain who was in Sherman's Army, in, in Raleigh, and it was founded in Raleigh, North Carolina, shortly after the war. James Walden became treasurer of Pleasant Plains Baptist Church, and he was the founder of two schools. My mother attended both, and I attended one, one of them. So this is a model of the school that was built on land that James Walden donated. It's down the road from, from here. My mother attended this school. Um, the Combo brothers, who you see here, uh, built this model, and they wanted me to see it. By the way, the Combos are descended from the first 20 and odd Africans who arrived in Jamestown in, in 1619. The Combo name comes from Africa, and they live a half a mile from here. Uh, you see Chawan Educational Association. This is a share of voting stock that James Walden bought, and the stock was used to start our first high school in 1886. And you see it the date, 1886. Um, this was his, his long going effort to f improve education for people of color in our area. And this is a school that I attended and my family attended. Uh, hundreds of descendants of Benton Triangle soldiers attended and taught at Waters Normal Institute. It is now called C.S. Brown STEM High School in Winton, North Carolina. John Collins worked there. His son, John Francis Collins, graduated from there, and went on to found the Frailing Housing School of Law in Washington, D.C. that existed around 1920. That school means a lot to us today. It is something that the war allowed us, the victory in the war allowed us to have. We couldn't have schools that went but so far. We were lucky to have a school before the war, but we probably wouldn't have ever gotten more than that had it not been a war. And on the centennial of the founding of C.S. Brown School, a lot of us came into town for its centennial. My siblings and I came in, and I photographed the event. Speaking on the last day, it was a weekend event, was Miss Alice Jones Nickens, who was a cousin. And she was a revered teacher at C.S. Brown, and a student at C.S. Brown. Her grandparents, include Wiley and Mary Jones, and her great-grandparents were Sally Jones Weaver and Willis Weaver. She and all, we are beneficiaries of what USCTs and other soldiers and officers contributed in expanding freedoms in America. 
Uh, we still appreciate it. And we look forward to more freedoms being expanded in America and in the years to come. And I want to thank you for listening to my program. We do have some questions here. And thank you very much, uh, Marvin, for your presentation. Okay. Fascinating story. All righty. Um, we do have some questions uh, coming in. and What was the post-war attitude of white locals to GRR members in their midst? Um, our county had a lot of small white farmers, and many of them, I think, knew they weren't going to benefit from a Southern victory. They were not likely to be allowed to uh, be prosperous enough to own to enslave a person. In fact, the county south of us had about 200 whites, 222 whites who joined the Union Army, 60 of whom defected from the Confederacy. I do know around 1877, William David Newsom's store was burned because there was a debating society. There were debates being held in that of a political nature, and, and William David Newsom was one of our leaders. Of course, he rebuilt the store, and I've been in his second store, which is now in ruins. I even collected a lot of papers from that store. Marvin, this is Susan. I have two questions, and thank you so much for this. Okay. Um, my first one is, I noted when you showed that that Noah, and I forget the last name. And Robbins? It, yeah, he had all the rights of a freed color person. Therefore, I assume that all the rights of a free white person were different. Is that correct? Oh, definitely. Um, people of <coughs> color, free people of color could not have stores. They could not have churches for the most part. They, the travel was restricted. Their commerce was restricted. Their education was restricted. Again, there was even a law that you couldn't have more than one or two dogs. That was a North Carolina law. And, you know, you think about that law. What happens when your dog has puppies? <laughs> you, almost, you, almost, you know, if you want to follow that law to the letter, you have to give your dog to, to a white person so the dog could have the puppies and then get your dog back but not get back the puppies to follow that law. You know, um, there were long lines. Uh, oh, uh voting was stripped from free people of color in 1835. Um, after the war, there were so many things that free people of color were able to do. Um, Hampton, Uni Hampton University was formed. People could get a high education there. Shaw University was formed. Again, we got a high school. Um, um, all kinds of community schools arose. It was no longer illegal to be literate. Um, travel just increased and, and trade increased. Um, um, I can name seven Joneses who had stores, including my great grandparents and of course my, my parents. I worked in my father's store. And you have a second question? I do. You've clearly been at this for decades and somebody who dabbles in a bit of genealogy trying to piece together my family, I find it's very easy to find documents like, well, pretty easy to find documents like marriage and birth and, and dates, but you have some real detail, rich detail about their lives. I was just wondering how you managed to piece all that together. And I know it's particularly hard on the African-American side of things. Um, because the Winston Triangle people were mostly free, they left more documents. For example, uh, people who, are, are, who have enslaved ancestors, and I have at least three enslaved ancestors. My great grandmother was one. Uh, she was Jack Robbins' first wife. Um, she doesn't show up until 1868 when she married Jack. She does not appear in the 1860 census. Uh, enslaved people were not included. Their names were not included. It was just included as like inventory. Um, her mother, her grandmother, they, they do not show up until 1870. And, and, and her mother does shows up in 1870 and 1880. We call that the wall. 
the brick wall and the, the brick wall of 1870. Uh, however, w free people um, show up in the census more often. Uh, again, some of them were Indians. So my, my, the earliest document I know of a family member that I, uh, well, we know that Jesse we uh, William Weaver, who was from India, came to the Chesapeake in 18 in 1690, around 1690. Mm -hmm. I recently received a scan from the North Carolina archives of my earliest Robbins descendant, John Robbins, in 1730. Uh, there's still documents I can't find, death certificates, marriage certificates. There's still some mysteries. Um, and, and then in a few other counties, uh, I, I noticed that uh, as a Winston Triangle produced a lot of census records, other free people in other counties didn't produce as many. Also, leaders produce more documents too. They show up in other in other in dissertations. They show up in other studies, other reports. Mick, you had some questions too. Uh, oh, the the question was, do you have any information about Winston Triangle the persons sailors. who joined the Navy? The one sailor I have followed is my great great grandfather Ben Morris, and Ben escaped in September of 1862 from Harrisville, which is a part of Hertford County. It's not part of the Winton Triangle. Uh, I believe he was enslaved, uh, but apparently he was literate. He served on about six gunboats, brown water gunboats. Uh, he returned to Harrellsville, started a Sunday school, and then about a year later came to Winton and was 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 collecting money from the Freedmen's Bureau for a small community school in Winton. This was 15 before the founding of my high school. Mm -hmm. um, so Ben Morris shows up on a few records. The other soldiers don't have much of a didn't need much of a footprint. Now the sales didn't leave much of a footprint. Yeah. And and the other question I had was about the the Indian tribe, the Joan Oaks. Do they still have a, a tribal tradition? Well, they still exist. And Southeastern Indian acclimated a whole, you know, have have acclimated a whole lot to Western civilization. They were uh, the closer you were to the clo coast, the more likely you ha you had to. Um, mix in best you could. Um, also, coastal Indians are more likely to become extinct. Mm -hmm. And so we do have a lot of coastal Indi uh, uh, nations that no longer exist. Uh, the Roanokes, the Roanokes um, that the English first encountered in 1584, they do exist, but they're not state recognized at all. What was the impact of Jim Crow in the Winton Triangle? You know, there's something a little little unusual about the white powers that be in Hertford County. They permitted the Winton Triangle to have a church in 1851. They apparently allowed it to have a school in 1859 because there's, there was county funding for a school at, um, and the money was given to a Pleasant Plains leader uh, Lawrence Weaver, who also had the contract to build the school in the first place, I mean, the church in the first place. Um, also, the white powers that be uh, allowed two women's colleges to be formed in the 1840s, a Methodist college and a Baptist college. And this is when colleges for white women were new and more of a Northern phenomenon than a Southern than a southern trend. If you look at the history of lynching in the area, the uh, Hertford County had only one lynching that was not in the in the Winton Triangle, whereas the other counties had more lynchings. Uh, they had more. They had more plantation owners. They had more more uh, enslavers. Uh, they had more of the enslaved. Um, but you still had segregation. You still had William David Newsom's store burned because of political activity. You still had schools that were not funded at the same level, like my school that weren't funded at the same level as the two white high schools. You still had a whole lot of restrictions. You still had to be told to be careful of how you behave out in public. 
the good thing about the triangle is many of us had relatives who had stores and a lot of trouble that black folks faced was being around white stores, you know, small stores. You have to remember that Harriet Tubman was struck on the head at an incident at a store that still exists in Maryland. The building still exists. And that injury affected her all her life. Um, in the Winston Triangle, you probably were likely to have relatives that had a store or more than one relative that had a store. And those store owners were leaders and their store owners were more likely to advise you of things, give you credit. Uh, there were safe places. My father's store was a safe place. There were whites who respected him because he was a good businessman. Uh, and, and my village, they grew up with him, they knew him. If you lived right in the heart of the triangle, it was a little different than the rest of the South doing Jim Crow. And I'm, I'm speaking from that personally, but I also have cousins my age that can tell me raw stories and what I can tell you. I had a question. I was wondering uh, how often, uh, Marvin, your family has family reunions and is there a designated historian? Um, we have, the family has spread out so much in rural areas Rural areas are have been left behind over the uh, economically and socially over the past few decades, and particularly if you're a family of color, so many relatives spread out. It started well over a hundred years ago. If you look at Jack Robbins, who had 15 children, 12 of whom survived, uh, only about a third of them stayed. That, that, and and that's a hundred years ago. Um, my great aunts and uncles, I had some that had like 10 and t up to 14 children and one would remain. And so when you have cousins now who are younger than I am, uh, who are living in Greensboro and, and, and Raleigh, Durham and Charlotte and Hampton Roads, other places, it's harder and harder to get together. We did have Jones reunions until about six years ago. And now it's harder for the new generation to have a reunion. Um, I'm considered the family historian and, and the community it considers me that as well. And I'm still, there's still research going on on Winston Triangle. I'm still, I, just yesterday, um, I categorized all 200 files I pulled online. And I have yet to look at land records because we are landowning. That's an important part of the research. There's some newspaper research I still need to do. And I still am in touch with uh, other branches of the family. Somebody said something about USCT relatives become Buffalo soldiers. No, they all stayed here. <laughs> uh, all that I know, all that I know, um, Oh, Martha Jewett asked that. My, my friend Martha asked that. They, uh, they stayed east. They did not go west. None of them, um, they all returned from Texas, as far as I know. I have one question oh. to the members at large, and that is, uh, what were the criteria uh, at the end of the Civil War on the Union side to qualify as someone who could receive a pension? Uh, if you served three months, would that qualify you? Or if you were wounded in uh, in battle, et cetera? For what I can tell, it can be a little complicated. I looked at, I've looked at 35 pensions. And mm -hmm. it, helped, it helped to have, it helped that you had some injury while you were in service. Um, Jack and Noel Robbins both complained about the stress Stress and stresses they went through. working on forts. Um, you had people who were not in battle, like at Fourteenth Heavy. None of them were in, were in combat. Again, they were garrison soldiers. They were laborers. Um, they would say they would say that none of them were career soldiers. They weren't allowed to be, if, even if they wanted to. Um, but they would say, "I'm partially disabled. I'm having trouble working." I, uh, uh, that neighbors would say he came back. He wasn't the same person physically as he was before. Uh, some of these neighbors were were soldiers themselves. Um, they would say, "I've known him ever since he was a boy or whatever." But he is part. He is having trouble and he needs help. And so some of these pension payments went to people who 
had injuries after the war. They had debilitations after the war, and they needed and they needed some support, of course. And then there were the widows and their children, their underage children, sixteen and under. And of course, if you were a Confederate supporter, you were out of out of luck. Well, there were state, well, the southern states would provide something. I understand for them. Well, I'm so glad that Susan uh, recommended having you speak to our, our yeah. group. That was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation.